Hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. Drew. Hey there. I'll let you get a chance to come on in. Uh, which camera am I using here? Just out of curiosity. Okay, good. Let me look at you guys on Restream. Hi there. This is the blue is hard to see. Sherry. Sherry, I see you. Um, Brandon, good afternoon. Afternoon. Let's get everybody on in. Hmm. So how are you feeling today, Dr. Drew? How am I feeling? Uh, a little washed out, I've got to say. I heard Somebody you laughing with Adam. I did laugh at Adam. Uh, we will talk about that on the Adam and Drew podcast tomorrow. He um, he was confronted by a city or some man who pulled over his car to tell him not to walk his dog on a horse trail. <laughs> and Adam responded with, that's perfect. <laughs> tell me more. I can't believe it. <laughs> who are you? Why do you? Why are you talking to me? You were laughing so hard. And I then he goes, and the guy pulled over, gets out of his car, and Adam goes, "Where's your mask?" And the guy goes, "Where's your mask?" And I, the, <laughs> like, no answer. Oh my goodness! Please explain Sweden. All right, let's take a look at Sweden and what's going on there. Uh, there was an interesting interview, provocative interview with his, um, with the Sweden CDC director, a famous epidemiologist. Sweden. Uh, is evolving. Let's put it that way. There's a big confidence interval between what they think is going to happen and uh, what might happen. It looks like they're going to meet their bed demands, their hospital demands. Uh, one of the big differences between Sweden and us that people need to be aware of is a uh, couple things. One is there are a lot of more people living alone in Sweden, so single single person dwellings. So that's a way they might not transmit the way we do. And number two, their nursing homes are much smaller. Ours are 100 plus bed facilities. Theirs are like three bed facilities. So they do that differently. And I don't know, I can't find this data anywhere, but in LA County, something like 50 or 60% of all the uh, cases were either nursing home patients or nursing, nursing home staff. So um, that's kind of interesting and worth looking at and thinking about. Um, let's see what else is on your mind. Uh, you're confused because it sounds like you're opening up and then you're not. Yes, you did bend the curve, but the problem is we don't want it to bend back the wrong direction. Here's one of the things, High Pennsylvania. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you for saying that, Mark. I, I was right from a numbers standpoint, uh, which I knew I would be. He said but, you were right? Yeah, but I was not right from the standpoint of the ferocity of this illness. I did get that wrong. And that's what I apologize for. And I've had patients die of this thing. And man, when it gets you, it is it is not like a normal flu. When it goes. You're right about the for, media, for, though. Oh, yeah. So for most of the people, the this is a normal flu, right? Uh, but for this small percentage of people, not small percentage, for people over 65 with metabolic syndrome, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, insulin resistance, obesity, it's crazy, crazy bad and deeply concerning. So I don't know what to make of that until we... In fact, I'm going to bring in Kate Shanahan in a few minutes here, who's a lipid expert, to see if we can come up with some sort of theory about what's going on here. She has her own ideas. I have my own ideas. So that's that. So if you fit that profile, you need to be very, very, very careful. But let, I, there's somebody, really, somebody posed an interesting question. Um, throughout human history, quarantining was of people who were sick. They've never quarantined everybody <laughs> You quarantine people who are sick, and that's the way we're going to do it now. That's the so-called, um, what do I call these measures, the uh, case reduction measures or the thing that's going to start in California on May 17th. Let me look that up too. So California, the University of Washington has not up there updated their data. It's about five days, which I find, again, I always find that peculiar. On May 17th, um, the containment strategy is going to kick in in California. And that would be quarantining sick people, which is what public health had always done through human history. So we we'll back to a more normal kind of measures. Um, uh, people used to not wash their hands. Not anymore, though. What is hypercholesterol? I mean, high cholesterol, primarily low HDL, high triglyceride, high LDL. We'll talk about that with uh, Dr. Shanahan in just a second. Dr. Shanahan is a famous biochemist and family practitioner, and she's got a lot of great ideas about this stuff. Uh, vitamin D deficiency, don't know what to make of that. Um, keto with no gallbladder, uh, you'd have to talk to your surgeon about that. It depends what kind of symptoms you're having, whether you're having dumping or fat malabsorption. It's a little bit of a dicier problem if you don't have a gallbladder because you're not squirting as much bile into your 
into your, into your small bowel, mm. and so you don't observe fat quite the same way. You may not produce chylomicrons the way you're supposed to, so I, I would talk to your surgeon about that. Um, California will have around 100 people in the hospital by mid-May. Yeah, uh, by mid-May, we, according to the maps, we'll have like zero people in the hospital by mid-May, mid-May, mid and midway, mid-May. And I actually asked the one of the doctors that, one of the statisticians that's working on the University of Washington data, which I admire greatly, and I said, why do we have to go to zero deaths and zero hospitalizations before you... Uh, start containment. Why Why not 10? Why not 20? Why zero? Actually, I'm looking at it here by May 17th. We are at 11 hospitalizations. So it's not zero, but nearly zero. It's zero deaths per day. And his response was a little hand wavy, which was essentially based on his models. That was the only thing that he they could imagine containing after that, based on what would happen in terms of the small outbreaks that are likely to occur. Now, I would urge everyone to keep your eye. Um, yes, I've seen Dr. Erickson, Erickson's briefing, and I'm trying to get him on my Fox 11 TV show to interview him. Mm. Um, and Dr. Erickson used raw numbers on the ground, but he he confused a couple of things, and I'd like to talk to him about that. He confused fatality rate. He conflated fatality rate, which is number of people who are sick or die of an illness, with probability of death from an illness as a member of the a general population. In other words, as Susan and I sit here right now, what's our risk of death from COVID? As opposed to if I come down with COVID, what's my risk of death? He conflated those things. He also conflated viral testing in a sick population versus random antibody testing uh, and antibody testing in the general population. It all get kind of conflated. I, I know he knows the difference, but he was trying to make an important point, but he conflated some important differences. So you're trying so to get him on Fox tonight? I'm trying to get him on Fox tonight. I don't think we have succeeded in doing that, by the way. I'm sure he's busy, but um, if you want to check out Fox 11 special report. Right, tonight, that's at 7 o'clock on Fox Pacific 11 here in Los time. Angeles. Pacific yep, time. Pacific time. Um, so what I was saying was I urge everyone to keep your eye on Georgia, right? Because Georgia actually picked exactly the wrong moment to open up the way they are, right? Their data is increasing. It's on the up turn. It's, it's, whoops, I got to get it out here. I'm looking at it right now at uh, covid19.healthdata.org. And, uh, ooh, did they just update? They did just Woo-hoo. update just this second, I think. Let me see. No, they didn't update yet. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, uh, so, the ladies uh, got to get their hair did. Yeah. So uh, they have expanded the confidence interval, it looks like to me, in terms of what the death rate might be in Georgia. So here's why I want you to watch it. So they're gener- they're right now fluctuating between essentially 14 to 20, up maybe as high as 40 or 50 deaths per day in Georgia. If that stays the same or turns down, that tells us something very specific. Well, two things possibly very specific, right? So they're, they're, they're loosening up right at the peak of their hospitalization and death rate. It should... If quarantine is a necessary feature of containing this, it should just continue up, right? But if it turns out that social distancing, wearing masks, being careful is sufficient or the same as quarantine, then you would expect this to continue along the slope it's on right now, which will be a very, it's an experiment. It's a dangerous experiment, but it will, it's, we should all keep our eye on it. Now, there's one other potential explanation if, if the slopes flatten which is that this virus is just uh, not interested in the summertime. Uh, So it's possible that now that things are heating up or getting into May, you will see a natural drop in the virus that is independent of all of our measures. uh, And I don't know when or where we will see that or whether we should see that. Is it true that 30 or 4-year-olds' odds are having more strokes? Thank you for asking. Uh, The schizo 7 uh, rare, rare, rare. I mean, rare. It's it's a rare but observed complication of COVID, like crazy rare. That's why doctors are studying it. It has to do with the clotting activation through something called an antiphospholipid syndrome. That is part of the syndrome. That's why that Broadway actor lost his leg. This happens. It's what's peculiar about it. It's happening in people who are otherwise sort of well. They're not sick per se. The kid in the ICU, it makes a little more sense. We're seeing more stuff like that. And they're young and it's 
rare. There are only like three so cases, right? Y- there are six cases or something. So this idea that doctors are seeing strokes, like, uh, yeah, yeah, rare, rare, yeah, rare, 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 rare. Things for us to worry about and things to anticipate and maybe there's things we can do to maybe prevent that risk and we need to be thinking about it when we are seeing young people with the COVID. What did Tyra say about headlines? There shouldn't be any headlines, I think he said. And that's, I think, medicine right. shouldn't be in headlines. That's what you said. It's just they're using it to draw you in. So, whatever's in the main headlines, just be careful. Well, there shouldn't be medical headlines. That's part. That's what I was screaming about from the, Hill, the be, from the beginning. But I will uh, you scroll down the page a little bit. You'll see more real stories. Yeah. Especially yeah. from Apple. Sorry, Apple. Somebody says uh, they're depressed, Drew, and they keep saying it. That always makes where, sense. Where is that? I don't see that person. What's the name? I don't know. She said it a few times. Well, I'm depressed too, so you're not alone. It's very common right now. I just did a whole podcast with uh, Josh Potter where he was complaining about his depression, and he's sinking into a, a state because <laughs> of his depression. I think our dog and is too. I think our, well, I think he's sick. But um, <laughs> and, and, yeah, I mean, that's another liability on all this. I'm starting to see a lot more ink spilled in the medical journals about the mental health consequence of all this. I, I think so far what I'm um, – Oh, that's nice. Uh, according to George, Piggy gave me and Tom Segura a shout-out. I appreciate that. Oh, is that the guy with the cups on his boobies? That's the guy. Thank oh. you for, thank you for describing him so I vividly. know. I saw that. I didn't like it. I didn't post it. I didn't like it. We don't like it, huh? Well, <laughs> the, uh, your mom's house crew seems to dig Piggy, so and he's quite a, he's quite a committed gentleman. Yeah. Um, but the point is, we are. I'm depressed, and I'm never depressed, Allie says. Yeah, I know. So here's the two things. Here's the two things I'm telling you. You have to have a future to not be depressed. If you can't see a future, this is where our leaders are failing us right now. They need to be able to say, like in California, May 17th, you can start to do X. Right. Because without being able to plan, without being able to see the future, we are getting depressed. That's how your head works. That's how that's how a lot that's how most people's head heads work. What about ordinary misery? This is a it's a great question. I would say I would say that this is a little beyond ordinary misery, what we are being asked to to uh, come up against right this now. This is not ordinary misery? This is a- abnormal misery. This is <laughs> extraordinary misery. Um, we are quite capable of, well, I was saying at the beginning, we should lean into it. We should lean into the anxiety, lean into the panic you might be having, because you might find some strengths there. So from the standpoint of ordinary misery, that's what I would say is lean into this stuff. You might find something Somebody uh, said they get, like me. I like you too, Kathy. And Joshua also, Roberts, explain more what you mean now. I'm, shout I'm out curious. to Joshua, by you the get, way. Wait, wait, Rod, Joshua says something interesting, and there might be something in there. I'm sorry. Egotistical <laughs> people are finally experiencing what life is like for all the little people. I don't know what that means, so give me a little more on that. Let's see if we can dig into that. Uh, why is leadership so poor and underhand in California? No, 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 I did not say that. I, I think leadership has actually been good in California. I, I think maybe excessive, but I, I've signed up on Team Newsom, and I think he's doing a great job. He has some tough decisions to make. He made a certain way of doing about it, and he, and he, he did it systematically and well. I, I have no, zero criticism. I mean, I could, I could modify it if I were, you know, I, you could think about it, do a thought experiment about modifying what he did, but the way he did it, what he did was fine. I think, I think you cannot, cannot fault him for the way he did things, and I knew it would work, and it did work. The question is, uh, what else? What else are we going to do to get out of this? And uh, even, it's interesting, if you, there's a uh, video out there of an interview with the, uh, essentially the CDC director from Sweden, and even he was saying, like, no, you can't just turn things back on. You have to crawl out of this. You have to, he, he called it going, uh, walking down the ladder from what you've done. And I, rung by rung, I totally agree with that. Uh, Massachusetts going out to June, June 1st. Let me, uh, uh, hold on. Uh, you may be getting tired of Newsom, but but I'm sure he's done. well. All right, so uh, what was I going to look up? You guys distracted me. I was going to look up <laughs> Massachusetts. There we go. Sorry about that. So Massachusetts, yeah, Massachusetts was having some problems. Uh, although the numbers aren't that high, it's sort of stretched out. So yeah, you don't. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to follow the same pattern as California, you pretty much have to begin containment around June first. Now, the good news that we, all right, so here's something I want to say that's interesting. I've got Massachusetts up there, and you are fluctuating between zero deaths per day and about 225 deaths per day. So that's weird. 300, zero, 220. I don't know what's going on with you guys in Massachusetts, why there's such fluctuation. But uh, something caught my eye this morning. 
And I will tell you about it after I first read what you guys are thinking. Um, uh, hold on here. I'm just reading your stuff here. Did a doctor commit suicide in, in New York City? I'm sure there is. I'm sure. This, I know that suicide is up. The ERs are reporting that. Says the head, New York Region, New York City doctor suicide, coronavirus. That, that's not surprising. That is not surprising. Uh, when California opens up, do I think th a massage therapist will be able to go back to work? That's going to be late. That's going to be with uh, people that do like cosmetology and stuff. Um, what if they wear a mask and they're super sanitary? I mean, yeah. I, I well, again, that's good. Could they do it with gloves? That kind of thing. I, I'm not making that call. Thank you. It's like going to the dentist. Like if you mm, just, then it's a little different. Yeah, you're right. It is a little bit like that. Um, we are having all kinds of mental health issues with with providers. That that's for sure. And that's again, that's why I've offered my services up there. Uh, Dustin says influenza claims two hundred fifty thousand to six hundred fifty thousand a year. We're almost two hundred thousand four months in with COVID. Careful with your data and careful um, comparing one one outbreak with another. Uh, a bartender missing his regulars. I understand that. Maybe they're sobering up a little bit. Depressed and we haven't bartenders. seen more. Th <laughs> depressed we haven't seen more therapeutic advancements. Well, yes. Uh, you, the, you look in if you want to see something interesting. Look into TC uh, transcranial magnetic stim TMS transcranial magnetic stimulation. We have Dr. Her Kate on the line. Oh, well, let's talk to Kate. Let's do that. Do I need to do anything? Say hello, Kate. Dr. Shanahan, welcome. Hi. Hey. So, so I just <laughs> Hi. spent a Thanks couple... Thanks for having me on your show again. As always. It's always a privilege. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes. Um, you and I have been going back and forth a little bit on some of the theories about how lipid metabolism, inflammation, metabolic syndrome antiphospholipid syndrome, how these things are kind of coming together to create the storms that we're seeing in COVID. Has your thinking about this change or evolved? Yes, I um, ha have come across some really interesting stuff that shows that lower cholesterol is actually associated with getting a more severe infection. So, so hold on, slow down. I, wait, 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 Kate, wait, wait. L lower, yeah, lower total, enough. yeah, well, not necessarily. Lower total cholesterol. So my question is, are we talking about total cholesterol or LDL, number one? And number two, did anybody parse out whether that's a existing lower LDL or therapeutic LDL in somebody on a statin? So, yes to all of the above. It's, it's uh, lower LDL, lower HDL, and lower total cholesterol. Uh, Pre-existing seem to uh, be part of the picture of those people who, who end up in the hospital and who have more serious illness once they end up in the hospital. So, so let me tell you, let me just, let me just, I, I know we're having a little bit of a connection problem, but let me, let me just tell you what my experience has been amongst patients that have had severe COVID in, in my experience. It's been people with essentially a metabolic syndrome, but sort of a, almost a subset of metabolic syndrome, the very low HDL, recalcitrant triglycerides, that, that's the group that really gets nailed. Is that right? That is, yes, and that is the more advanced metabolic disease. These are the people who have more severe insulin resistance. Whether or not they're diagnosed with diabetes or prediabetes, and insulin resistance is this is a it's a metabolic condition that develops when uh, you know your diet is unhealthy. But doctors have been focusing on cholesterol and animal fat and completely ignoring the fact that most people are living on sugar and vegetable oils. You know, two-thirds of most people's diet, the average American, is consuming very little other than sugar, flour, and vegetable oil. Mm -hmm. There's 33% of your diet left that's actual healthy food. And because we've been telling people... Oh, you know, a healthy diet, you've got to avoid butter, you got to avoid dairy, you got to avoid meat. We have been giving people, uh, you know, carte blanche to have a diet that's basically a little more than sugar and vegetable oil, which is to say totally junk food. Yeah. And so people have been developing this met these metabolic diseases. We're not even looking for them because we're all focused doctors. And so when I say we, I mean most doctors, because I learned this in medical <laughs> school myself, 
we're we're taught that if your cholesterol is low, you're healthy. And and we don't really pay attention to much else. We don't pay that much attention. We pay a lot more attention to high LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, than we pay attention to low HDL, the so-called good cholesterol. Now, now, so what these studies seem to be showing, yeah, are. yeah, these studies seem to be showing that there is no bad cholesterol. Cholesterol is not the enemy here. The enemy is whatever it is that makes your HDL drop, and of course. I have the answer to that, as you know, because uh, I've been talking about vegetable oil and sugar for a long time. Those two things, and especially the vegetable oils, they drop your cholesterol. That's been known since the 50s. Mm. And they're very pro-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And we have these people with inflammatory fat. And that you, go, you, you have a body full of inflammatory fat, and then you get sick with an infection, a virus, a, a serious, you know, viral infection. The flu is also very serious. So is this coronavirus. It makes you, your whole body feels like, you know, you feel like you've been hit by a truck yeah. when you know, get a fever with this thing. And your body is fighting that with, by creating inflammation on purpose, right? So you have a, a body that is basically ready to go into an inflammatory mode. And then now you it, uh, accidentally, right? There's all these little minor accidental uh, inflammatory processes that cause heart, small heart attacks, and strokes, and blood clots, right? And, uh, so, all so, the things that we know are associated with metabolic syndrome. But you combine that with an, an on-purpose inflammatory uh, se sequence of events that the body has to do to get rid of the virus, right? And you get these serious complications, the cytokine storm, which is what puts people, people seem to be doing okay, and then in three days they're dead. Can you explain um, what that is? The ARDS, which is the so, so, fluid in the lung. So let's talk about cytokine is, storm a little bit. And, and by the way, for Ramey and others, yes, I wear masks. I follow the state of California recommendations meticulously. I'm home right now. I'm not going to wear a mask while I'm on my, on my uh, video here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all the mask police are out there. Uh, so let's talk about what, what a cytokine storm is. Susan wants to know what we mean by that. Yeah, I don't know what that is. It, it, it's uh, when your cells are injured, they release these uh, like little signals that are cries for help from the immune system. Mm -hmm. And we call them cytokines. And so they're, they're like um, they're like messengers. They're, yeah. they're sort of protein and other kinds of structures that, that send out almost like a message in a bottle that come come this way. And it, it's a cascading kind yeah. of a thing uh, that directs cells to the site of inflammation. But it can get out of control. Exactly. And, and a, a lot of that stuff is made out of polyunsaturated fatty acids. And um, these are the things that are in the seed oils. These are the things that are in junk food. And so when your body fat is, is overly full of these polyunsaturated fatty acids and you are in this state of cellular injury where your, your, your body has got enzymes that take these polyunsaturated fatty acids and turn them into cytokines, you just get like such an incredible overload of these cytokines, which... Uh, leads to basically circulatory collapse because you right. get, you know, there's so many of these chemicals that are causing dilation and leak, dilation of your blood vessels and leaking of fluid out of your blood vessels. Yeah, it's a and very, it's a body. very, it's so weird. You, it's a, it's, a, it's very weird. I must tell you, having seen this, it's a, it's a, it feels like an accelerated sepsis. That's the only thing I can relate it to. Like if, if somebody had an E. coli sepsis that was, going fast. That's what it looks like to me. That sounds exactly like what, you know, it, what I was actually thinking as well is that like, this is like sepsis, which is normally something where if your immune system is not strong enough, then the bacteria just have their way with you. And usually, you know, that's how bacteria kill you. It's almost like through septic shock. Right. And this is, this is, like that's happening, but it's not the viruses or the bacteria or any invading organism that's doing it to you. It's your own body just not being effective in killing viruses and, and basically having just an extremely exaggerated response. It would be like if you, you know, when you sprain your ankle, let's say like your whole leg swells up right. instead of just having a little bit of, right. you know, sprained by the ankle. 
So, it's so let, let, me ask this. Let, let me ask this. I've never noticed, you know, I've treated a lot of sepsis in my career, and I've never noticed that sepsis, I, I think of one case, though, where this is true, but I've never noticed that overweight metabolic syndrome was a risk factor for sepsis. Do we know that that is in bacterial well, sepsis? Uh, so there, we know that with pneumonia, um, HDL being low, the good cholesterol being low, and total cholesterol being low have been actually uh, known to be associated with a higher risk of worse outcomes with pneumonia. They didn't parse out whether it's sepsis or whether it's the ARDS. Then it's sometimes it's difficult to do that. But um, I, I think the point here is is really it's not so much that the infection is particularly aggressive, right? Sepsis is the infection is so aggressive it overwhelms your immune system right. and basically you have you have these inflammatory responses all over your body because right. you have a bazillion more organisms in your body. Right. We don't ha necessarily have to have these bazillion or, organisms or, in our body or a toxin with the coronavirus or, or an exotoxin or endotoxin something like that. Right. Some some elaborated yeah. chemical yeah, that exactly. you know, puts us into shock. So but so let me go back to the low LDL, low total, low HDL, high triglyceride. When somebody gets sick with COVID, what, should the recommendation include get off your statin immediately? You know, that's, uh, uh, it might be too late at that point. Uh, you know, like I'm not sure how much it would help. I know that um, there's all kinds of research of using statins in the intensive care unit and sometimes actually because I think statins actually suppress the immune system a little bit. And sometimes when, um, you know, people are dying of infections, part of what's killing them is their own immune system being out of control. So right. is that good or bad in that scenario? I don't, I don't know. I think, I think really what I would like to see is more of a, you know, conversation around, look, a lot of people uh, know they have a weight problem and they think that that means it's going to cause them problems in the, some distant future. It's so abstract. Right, right. I think that this coronavirus is an opportunity for doctors to say, hey, um, you know, this is real. This is now. This could happen again next year. It could happen to you if you get the flu, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, it, I don't, I'm, and people I have don't to remember 60,000 60, deaths from the flu also. And so one of the fears next winter is yeah. that we have 60 of the flu and 60 of COVID. That's going to be a lot of deaths. Which is what we had this year, but uh, you could but have it all could have it all at once. But the reason, the only reason that this we don't see this kind of thing happening with the flu every year is that because the people in the age group where we're having like these shocking deaths from coronavirus, they've been exposed to the flu on an annual basis, and there's flu vaccines, and right. we also have Tamiflu, which right. is an antiviral. So, right. were it not for those three factors, we would have seen this every year with the flu. Right. And, uh, you know, if we if we ever get a real bad flu, which is very different, you know, by which I mean a, a flu that's very different than anything our bodies have seen before. Right. That the, the, the virus, the uh, vaccine, influence, the vaccine doesn't protect you against. Right. We'll see this again with that flu. Yeah. But we'll see this again with the next coronavirus. And what I'm saying is let's use this as an, uh, let's, you know, doctors as, use this as an opportunity to have a whole different conversation with our patients. It's not some distant future that you need to lose weight for. It's not to prevent this, you know, some stroke or heart attack, which, yeah, you're not going to get that for another 10 years. It's next time there's one of these infections. Because I, I would stake my reputation on it. If we look at the people who are these supposedly healthy people, where, where we keep hearing these headlines about this virus, the fear mongering, I don't think they're healthy. I think they were undiagnosed as pre diabetic and definitely undiagnosed as insulin resistant because doctors aren't even trained to look well, for that. Well, I, I can tell you, and I, and I do look for that stuff, um, I can tell you that uh, <laughs> I've, I've now had a bunch of COVID, I've seen, and and I've even seen elderly, elderly patients with lots of medical problems, but without these metabolic issues, they get very sick, they go to the hospital, and they come home. While if they have this, these issues and they're older, it's just shocking how fast they fall apart. I mean, it is shocking. Hmm. So, wow. And, so, and, I mean, those are two separate things, right? One is the older folks, they have, they still have a, 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 a you know, 
a healthy metabolism, but their immune system is a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. So they get sicker, they get but sick. eventually their immune system wins the battle. That's right. That's exactly right. They get better. Not all. I mean, not all. There can be lots of complications and things. Right. But, hopefully. But, but it's, but it's mm -hmm. you know, watching the metabolic patients fall apart. It, now, let's talk a little bit about the antiphospholipid syndrome, which is this thing that I don't know how to speak about meaningfully. <laughs> It's it's something that occurs rarely out in the world. Say it in English. Um, yeah, that's what I'm trying to. It, it's essentially a how should we describe it? A, a protein that's associated with hypercoagulability related to inflammation. Is that a way to say it? it occurs in. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. It's like it, your body has created an antibody to itself, but right. only like. A, not not something that's part of yourself on a daily basis, right? It's, but, it's but, only something that your body makes under certain circumstances. But but in 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 well, I have seen it both in lupus patients where it's sort of more common or rheumatic patients, but I've also seen it in metabolic patients, like we're describing here, and have seen somebody go very uh -huh. bad with exactly what you're talking about plus antiphospholipid. So and so, how does that figure into this whole story? Well, I think the so antiphospholipid, lipid in there refers to fat. And yeah. what I think is happening is that, um, you know, because these polyunsaturated fatty acids that are the main ingredient in junk food and vegetable oils, um, they are lipids and they are, um, you know, in higher concentration in your, your bloodstream when you have, ha when you've had this kind of a diet that your body can start to make antibodies that, um, your, your body gets, your immune system gets confused. And instead of making antibodies against foreign invaders, it makes antibodies against like your own body parts, like including your platelets, right? I think this is what the um, antiphospholipid syndrome, yes. it, it, it ends up causing blood clots by, because right. antibodies bind to components in your bloodstream that are supposed to be, you know, flowing, but these, these, these antibodies start, they, they start accumulating around on the antibodies and start causing little teeny tiny clots and then bigger clots and bigger clots. And, and that, and, and that seems to be, the immune system has made a mistake. And, and there's something linking that kind of a phenomenon with COVID. So COVID's not activating the clotting system the way n normal sepsis does. It's doing it through these inflammatory mediators, right? Y we yes. think. We so, think. so what's happening is, be, I think what's happening is that um, the uh, the cell membranes in the body of people who have this more severe metabolic syndrome yeah. are more loaded with like omega six uh, type of polyunsaturated fatty acids that are the very that are the kind that when activated uh, when enzymes act on them they become. Like clotting fat, you know. Okay, so hold on. So this this clot, is a. I feel like we're going to the world of speculation, but let's go there. Which is so you're saying that yeah, these it's omega speculation. Okay, omega six is in the cell wall of m many of the cells in yeah. our body. Let's say, how long would that take to come out yeah. if you went on a strict diet of none of these seed oils or polyunsaturated fats, or would it? Uh, probably within a few weeks because, okay. uh, you know, what happens is these are cells that your your bone marrow is making every few days. Okay, okay. And so it's mega, know, they, it's, it it's, a, it's mega it's karyocytes. A, a few it's, weeks to make them. It's platelets and mega karyocytes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's high turnover cells have this stuff in there. So, all right, so there's that. And, and then, uh, oh, I had a good question. And what was it? Damn. Can't remember. You see, but you didn't answer the question about the statin. What I mean, let's say I'm working in an ICU. Should I stop my statin? And by the way, you know, I think for me, taking a statin was a smart thing to do. We have a, you know, um, low HDL, high triglyceride thing in our family, which I've managed with diet. Could never get the LDL down. I have horrible vascular disease in my family, and my calcium score is 0, 0.0, like 20 years on a statin. 0, 0.0, pretty amazing, given my family history. Um, and a lot of that, I had low HDL and high triglyceride. It was finally in the last couple of years I got that under control. Well, Dr. Drew, you should watch this uh, video called The Power of Zero. 
um, because there's a doctor there who's a standard cardiologist, doesn't really specialize in nutrition, hasn't drank the kind of Kool-Aid that a lot of the low-carb doctors have, have, have drank where we kind of don't, we don't see our saturated fat anymore. And he says that if you don't want to take a statin, you should get a calcium score because if your calcium score is zero, you don't get any benefit from statin. And that holds, he, he predicts, for at least five years. That, that may be true, but my family history is so horrible I don't want to risk that. And and by the way, we have a certain kind of vascular disease. We we but listen, we have we have a strange we have large vessel vascular disease, large vessel, which is which is a sort of a separate thing, right? And and my large vessels look pretty good, and I got on it early, and I didn't get the HDL under control until recently, following some of the dietary recommendations that you suggest. So I don't know, I, I don't know, but but if I were going to go work in an ICU, which might happen yet. I think I might get off my statin, right? Yeah, I'm, it, it, yes. If you didn't have any kind of questionable history, like you know, maybe some kind of very unusual genetic um, component there, um, I would say definitely you don't need it. I mean, I I don't prescribe statins to people who are on a healthy diet um, because the, my understanding of the way they work is is that there's very little benefit to be had if you can follow a healthy diet. And there's a lot of drawbacks uh, in terms of the immune function. There's so many studies that we've had over the years that show that lower people with lower cholesterol are more likely to die from infection. And now's not the time to be, you know, worried about lowering your cholesterol for a heart attack you might have in 20 years. No, that's right. And and (laughs) I, I developed, I had H1N1 11 years ago and I was, brutally affected by that. I mean, I think I had whatever all this COVID stuff, I had something very similar going on. Hey, Drew, I, when was your last physical? Uh, really? Eight months ago, six months ago. Okay. Why? Talk to your doctor. Well, this is a, these are all theoretical <laughs> things. These are the, He would probably say stay on it. I, if, definitely if I go work in ICU, I'll talk to him about it. Because yeah. I also would, I talked about, I would ask about hydroxychloroquine too. Uh-huh. Like whether I should take that as a prophylactic agent. Because people are doing that. So, um, Somebody asked, "What about flaxseed?" That's that... true. When you were go ahead. When I was oh yeah okay. wait 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 okay. I... first your question I wait 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 your question first when I when I was what when I was oh. what uh, I just wanted to kind of follow up on when uh, you were asking about the antiphospholipid antibody that, yeah. that's um, that's not something I have a huge uh, like area of expertise about right. but as far as just like the tendency towards inflammation that people who have the low HDL and the high triglycerides right these are folks who are at high risk for so many things. It's, it's, they're at high risk for blood clots. Mm-hmm. They're at high risk for cancer. They're at high risk for gout. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, all of these things are related to inflammation. Mm-hmm. And so um, that isn't, I don't think, speculation. Like, you know, you were you were pointing out that, yeah, this is a suit. That when we were talking about the antiphospholipid, yeah, yeah, yeah. I admit that is totally yeah. speculative. Yeah. But I've been, you know, seeing this pattern of, inflammation and and inflammatory diseases if you have an h you you can almost guarantee you are if you want to make your body like almost bulletproof in terms of metabolic diseases and blood clots and you know really horrible reactions to infections do this get your hdl over 60 get your triglycerides to be less than 1.25 times your hdl make sure your fasting blood sugar averages less than 90 get some sleep get some exercise boom you are good. Get plenty of sleep. I mean, not just like yeah. some. Can you say that again? And, and exercise no. regularly. So, so it's get your HDL above 60, get your triglycerides one and a half times tri- HDL. Was that your recommendations? Or two times? Yeah, one less times. than one and a half times yeah. your HDL. And, and yep. um, make sure your fasting blood sugar is, is normal. You, your, fasting, yeah, yeah but consistently less than 90. So normal is up to 100, but I don't think that's low enough. Should we be doing A1Cs so on everybody? Make sure that. A1C less than 5.7? We should. Yeah. We really should. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. fine. Absolutely. I, I, that's, I think we that's... We really should so be doing so that on everybody. Want, you want the tigris, ty, triglycerides at 90? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah roughly speaking, under 90. Yeah. So, so, mm-hmm. so, yeah. Kate... If your HDL is 60, yeah. So, so, since we become acquainted, I went and on essentially a, you know, no carbohydrate, higher fat, high protein kind of thing. And my, my triglycerides, which had always been at 200, immediately went to 75. And my HDL, which had always been 45, 50, went above 60. 
So I have made fantastic. Yeah. So I've been on that diet ever since. I'm sure I fluctuate around a little bit. I, I, but if you I, went off the statin, I wonder what would happen. Well, you know, Vinny and uh, what else? I, uh, Dr. Feldman, I think, were trying to convince me to do it. I, I just worry that I have some weird genetic something going on. It's been, it's been too good. My, my, do it for a month. You probably oh, do, I can do, do it, for, it for a month. Oh, get your blood tested. Yeah, do it for a month. It's no problem. But, but I always my LDL could never get below 130. No matter hey, what I do. He hasn't had a carb in three years. <clears throat> Two years. Two years. Two? I'm, yeah, I've Feels had like a 30. little wow. bit, but I've been I've been really watching the carb. I mean, and, I, and I'm telling I you. I some Fritos for lunch. <laughs> but I think I, I that's why. sandwich you, with mayonnaise well, Kate on and it. I were, mayonnaise <laughs> fine. Kate and I were going back and forth about the insulin resistant and how that's mediated. You want to talk about that a little bit? And the lipid connection with insulin? Uh, so the yeah the <clears throat> insulin resistance I think um, uh, you get it. So insulin resistance is the underlying thing that develops before you get prediabetes or diabetes. But if you have insulin resistance, you never have to get diabetes, and you can still get all the complications. And I'm talking about vision problems, kidney problems, um, heart attack, strokes, yeah. uh, cancer, which we know is at higher risk in diabetic. So insulin resistance, you don't want it. Um, how do you get insulin resistance? Well, um, w what happens is if you have too much polyunsaturated fat in your body fat, then your your cells don't get energy when you're burning your body fat. They don't get enough energy, so they have to, for their own survival, suck more sugar out of your bloodstream, right? So this is why people get hungry between meals, even though they just ate two, three hours ago, because if you are insulin resistant and you have this body fat that your body, that doesn't give you energy, you have to get your energy from somewhere. You, that means sugar. So your cells are going to slurp more sugar out of the bloodstream. And what's going to happen? Your blood sugar is going to go down low. It's going to drop too low. And over time, your body's going to say, well, okay, I hate when that happens. So I'm my, the brain, your brain is going to, if you have insulin resistance, your brain is right now telling your liver to make more sugar, to make so much more sugar that actually it's slightly higher than normal, like all the time. So yep. a sign of insulin resistance is a fasting blood sugar consistently in the upper 90s. Mm. So this is before you are ever diagnosed with prediabetes. And that's happening because your brain is telling your liver, make me more sugar. I don't care if you've got to turn muscle into mm -hmm. sugar to do mm -hmm. that. Because you can't make sugar from your body fat. You can't make sugar from very much stuff. You have to, the only thing that your liver can make it from is if, if it doesn't have any anymore, uh, you know, just in storage, if it's run through its little bit of storage, then it can start making it from amino acids, which it has to get by breaking down your muscle. And meanwhile, though, the pancreas says this blood sugar level is too high. I'm going to produce insulin to get this blood sugar level down. And the liver is caught in between this argument between your brain saying, raise the blood sugar and your pancreas saying, lower the blood sugar and the brain wins. And that means that the, the liver is resisting the insulin that the pancreas is putting out. So the liver insulin resistance starts in the liver for most people. And you can get insulin resistance in other tissues for different reasons, but it all has to do with this mixed messages that are occurring because your body's not able to get energy when you burn your body fat it's, and it produces inflammation instead. And um, that's the subject of the fat burn fix, which is in my latest book where I really take a deep dive into what I've been calling public enemy number one for like 15 years. And, and, you know, hopefully after more people read this book, they'll understand that it really truly is public enemy number one. Mm. Well, I, uh, I, and by the way, you, you mentioned, we got to get through the flaxseed oil. We didn't answer that question. And um, you said seed oils. Does that include things like peanut butter or almond butter? So, um, no, those are like culinary wise nuts. And, and actually when it comes to like how your body works, mm -hmm. the culinary terms are much more meaningful. So like, um, you know, it's, the culinary people call it tomato a vegetable, right? Mm -hmm, Technically, mm -hmm. botanically, it's a fruit, mm -hmm. but it's lower in sugar. So, um, so flax seeds, I think, are definitely healthy. Now, do you want to do you want to make base your diet on flax seeds and have to have a whole ton of them every day? 
absolutely not. You don't want to do anything, you know, to the extreme like that. Most people take flax seeds because they want to get omega three. Mm-hmm. The crazy thing is, you can if you if you have not been avoiding vegetable oils, and you don't have very much omega three in your body. Say you got a blood test and it showed your omega three was low, but you've not been avoiding vegetable oils, and suddenly you realize, oh my god, I've been eating a lot of these things, and you cut them out. Without adding any more omega-3, your omega-3 levels will rise. Mm. This is based on a study that was done uh, by a guy at the NIH um, on people who had migraines, actually. Mm. And not only did it raise their omega-3, their migraines evaporated. Mm. It was amazing. Mm. That's interesting. So flaxseed is good. Yeah, because line. of all the inflammation. Flaxseed is good, yes? Uh, so I, I, yeah, flaxseeds are good, yeah. yeah. But if you're doing it just for, you know, just for the omega-3, you're not going to get the same benefit if you aren't also cutting out the vegetable oil. So, so again, just, just so people really get it, give them the things to be avoided again. Just spell them out. And, just, and this, is, this is not related to COVID. This is related to public enemy number one. And that happens to dovetail into yeah. COVID. But let's, <laughs> let's just spell it all out. What, what, and Susan, write these down. So what are they? There's three C's and three S's. So the C's first. That's corn, canola, cotton seed. And then the S's, we have soy, sunflower, safflower. Those are the ones that you're going to find in the grocery store. So that's kind of like uh, the, the, there's six that are the major ones that are in ingredients and stuff that you might buy, like mayonnaise and salad dressing, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, even canned tuna. Um, and then there's when you go out to eat, if you are you know, want to be one of these people that ask, what do you make? What are you cooking your stuff in back there? Um, there's grapeseed and rice bran oil that yes. those tend to show up in restaurants a lot. Mm. Um, so those are also, they're all bad because they're too much polyunsaturated fatty acid and we just, it's more than we can handle. We I'm, can't I'm use going back to my carnivore oh, diet. It's just simpler. I'm just going to eat meat. That's it. I'm just going to eat high quality <laughs> grass fed beef. And I can't keep track of everybody and everything. I, I was just thinking I've been eating some uh, salad dressings lately and I thought, oh crap, now, now that's out. So it's corn. Oh gosh, I wrote it so fast. It, okay, corn. What's the second one? It went so fast. Cotton seed. Cotton. Canola. Canola. Okay, thanks. Cotton seed, soy, saff, safflower. Right, not saffron, and but sunflower. safflower and sunflower. Right, right. So I said I have that sunflower. Safflower. Yes, I mean here's the thing. I mean it, it is. I hear what you're saying, Drew. It's like oh my god, it feels like so much to keep track of. It's depressing. You can't like go out to to uh, like just a restaurant like a normal person. You have to, you know, almost become this detective about what is in my food? What is in my food? Well, guess what? If we don't ask what's in our food, that means yeah. somebody's taking advantage of us. No, no, listen, I, I, I'm, 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 just, I'm, just, I'm just sort of lazy about diet. I don't like being picky and stuff. So I'm just going to go back to my high quality meat and that's it. <laughs> I, I tell you something, I feel better when I do that. I, I'll, I, I really do feel better when I do that. I, I get a little anaerobic exercise, lift weights. High quality meats, maybe some cheese. There you go. That's about it. <laughs> Somebody wants Dr. Eric. He might. We're trying to get him on Fox. Erickson. Yeah, I'm trying to get Eric. I don't think we got him today, but we might get him. Anyway, um, Kate, I got to wrap up. I have to go do this Fox 11 thing. That's what Susan just reminded me about. I got to do that. But it's always a privilege to talk to you. And, God bless uh, you. Yes, and thank Likewise. you. He, shout, he shouts out your name every so often, and and I have to call you. So yeah, it was yesterday. I was sometimes something, in something. his sleep. <laughs> Something came up, and I said, right, "You got to get Kate Shanahan in here." Oh, no. <laughs> Giving you nightmares. <laughs> no, Kate Shanahan said I can't go okay, to my so, favorite restaurant. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. So Cunningham, so thank comes, you again. For wait, wait, one more answer. thing. One more thing. Somebody says be a vegetarian. Um, when Duncan's coming on Friday, uh, all uh, the Nash seed Connell. oils, all the seed oils have, are are made out of you know vegetables. That's why they call them vegetables. But so just it won't fry save it in the you. Seed you oils. Have to read ingredients. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't get enough. Yeah. If you know. have vegetables, don't fry them. Fry them in seed oil, right? Yeah, and I, right. And I don't right. object to that's, that's vegetarianism. Right. Soy, sunflower, sunflower, I just don't think corn. I can do it. Look, look at me. I just have to go. Just so simple. I have to go very, very simple, or I just can't maintain it. <laughs> I didn't even and know there was a cotton oil. Cotton seed. Cotton seed. Cotton. Oh, I said cotton. Oil. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kate. I'm gonna I let you go. Fast, Thank you so much, thing. and uh, no doubt we will talk again soon. Okay. 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 Take care. See you, Kate. Bye bye. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Bye. You got it. Chris says he's confused. Low HDL, normal LDL is a risk factor. Yes.
That's what she said, and low triglyceride. Um, but, she, you know, uh, again, I, we, I don't, none, none of that conversation we just had was formal recommendations. This was just a discussion about the science. She's a biochemist. She's an excellent biochemist. She's been, she's also a physician, a family practitioner, and she's been an advisor to the Lakers and major sports teams for quite some time. And uh, she is uh, one of the most knowledgeable person. That you, she said to me once, she goes, I can't say anything about nutrition because it's too complicated, but I know this fat story because that, that's something we can parse out in the science. I thought, oh, that's somebody I can listen to because nutrition is way too complicated scientifically to make meaningful, you know, specific things, except in very specific siloed areas. So we're just wondering, we started this conversation wondering about whether yeah, or not... Don't take a clip of this and do the only part where we said it wasn't a... Yeah, I know. This is the driving me crazy. Stop <laughs> taking clips of things I say at a period of history where it's true, playing it back later and not giving the entire statement I made. <laughs> Stop it. You know, what? I was just thinking, I always had really, really low cholesterol. Yeah. But it's like, uh, it's normal now and a little, maybe a little high. Now I'm kind of happy that I was worried before that my cholesterol was going up. Yeah. Well, your numbers weren't that great, but it's okay. (laughs) I I, got to look at them again. I I think your HDL was down, which bothered me because you'd always had an up HDL, but whatever. We'll look at it again. I have to go back. We have to repeat it. Yeah, you just it just seemed out. That seemed like a weird. I have to get a physical every year. It seemed like a weird. The reading was weird. It doesn't seem like your normal numbers, so we had to read them again. Uh, So uh, Duncan Trussell is coming Friday. Clancy himself will be here on Friday. You can hear him on the Joe Rogan podcast right now. He's doing a whole lengthy interview there about aliens. (laughs) <laughs> and, <laughs> Zombie. and aliens and zombies which is duncan's <laughs> favorite pastime uh, i'll see if i can contain clancy to a you know a single single thought process when he comes in on friday it's gonna be great the other day he told me he wished he had bought a gun <laughs> D- duncan said he wished he'd bought a gun yeah. jesus i um, wish i had bought a gun <laughs> we'll see uh pl- pray for new jersey let me see what's going on. i saw your governor speaking this morning and i was deeply impressed with his uh smarts he seemed to be on top of things, and he seemed to be making good decisions. We are right now, you're on the downslope. You've met your your needs of hospital beds and the ICU beds. Your daily death rate, we will see. It's uh, been falling. It was only 134 only. It's a, I know it's a lot of people. It's, it's crazy we're saying things like only. Uh, a couple of days ago, but we don't have it updated yet. Now, what, what your governor did say, this is something I wanted to say, is that he said, uh, pay no attention to the numbers over the weekend. Both Cuomo and your New Jersey governor said that. Pay no attention to the data coming in on Monday. And I've noticed that the University of Washington has delayed its data too. So something's going on in the data that's troubling people. It may be that this thing is falling quickly because this is a virus that doesn't like the heat of the season. So it also may be that it's a recording artifact and it means nothing. So we are going to have to see what University of Washington comes up with. But when they started saying to in the press, hey, don't pay any attention to the numbers, don't pay any attention to the numbers, I thought, uh-oh, that means that the numbers are doing something and we don't want to say it's a trend yet until we know for sure. But uh, my suspicion is that either they, they're right, that it's a recording error, or something is going on. So keep a close eye. I'll try to come back tomorrow, will I not? Um, Susan, tomorrow we have time to do one? I'm because I, I'm, I'm hoping, I yeah, do. let me just look real quick. You just have the Adam I'm, and Drew I'm, I'm, podcast, I'm sure. <laughs> and then you're done around 2 o'clock. Uh, yeah, so we can do one around 2 o'clock or so tomorrow. and um, Maybe the same time, like since we did it today, we'll do it like a right, before. All right, it's a good, good idea. We'll do it around this time tomorrow, and hopefully the presidential stuff will have come and gone by then. That. Nobody's watching today anyways. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you so much for watching. When thank is you for- California going to open, Drew? May 17th is what we're aiming towards. Mm-hmm. So let's, and the question is how and what is going to open then? That's the bigger question. So there you go. Um, I will see you all tomorrow around the same time, maybe a little bit earlier. I'm ready now. And the thank you, Kate Shanahan, and uh, check out Fox 11 this evening at 7 o'clock. We'll see Wait, you. let me put up the banner for that. Okay. Okay. I'm going to find it. Okay. All righty. Here we go. There it is. 7 o'clock p.m. You can find it on facebook.com slash Dr. Drew. And also, if you're in the L.A. area or Orange County, greater Los Angeles area, you can see it on Fox 11. So check it out. Thank you so much. See you next time. See you tomorrow.